All right, Entree Architect community. It's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation for Thursday, June 9th, 2022. As you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from, both your location and the social media platform that you're on. We're streaming out all over the internet. This is our attempt to break the internet. We're glad that you're here. Uh, let us know that you're here. It's fun to see where everybody is and see who's along the ride for this conversation. If we've never met before, my name's Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis. I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you are the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar and you've said 2022 is my year and you're on the runway to starting your own thing. Or maybe you have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or, I don't know, 23 years. And you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture. And they're all the need to know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So thanks for joining me today. As you're looking at the screen right now, you might go, hey, this is a different look. <laughs> Usually, uh, Catherine McPhail is my co-host. She's off doing some important things today, taking care of some things. Uh, so Mandy Freeland has graciously stepped in. She's been here before, by the way. I don't know if you know. If you remember which episode that Mandy Freeland co-hosted with me, Put that in the chat right now or in, in the comments right now, wherever you are. Let me know what episode, who the guest was when Mandy Freeland last co-hosted with me. While you're thinking about that and probably Googling and whatever. Hi, Mandy. How are you? Hi. I am doing well. It's actually pretty hot here. And I thought Scott was being funny. I know it's hot in California. And so Scott says that Mercury is rising in San Francisco. It is getting hot. <laughs> Well, for all of you people out in California that are sweating, you should come to the Midwest. We have a rare, beautiful day here in uh, in Indianapolis and across the Midwest. So uh, you've got some options. You don't have to. You don't have to bake out there. <laughs> I do see. I see. I see Scott's comment, which is the first one in on my screen, which means that Scott is the winner of today's John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award. We give that out every single day for the person who makes it to, into the room first. So congratulations, Scott. I think that's like six days in a row Scott has uh, has won that Crocheted Bathtub Award. We also typically give away two other awards. One is the, the award for the person who has virtually traveled the furthest, because we do have a global audience here. I like to say from Anaheim to Australia. Um I'll keep an eye out for Audrey because if Audrey makes it in from Australia, she trumps everybody. Essentially, it's it's pretty hard to get further away from Indianapolis than uh, than uh, Sydney. So uh, she might win the Crocheted Yacht Award for furthest virtually traveled. And then we have an award for the uh, the largest. How do we say that? The largest constituency, the mo the largest group of people from one location. There's always some hot debate as to how to divide that up. Does California count as one place or is it, you know, do you have to, <laughs> there's, Mandy's, Mandy's leading the charge for, for the, uh, the hot folks in, uh, in California, but uh, that's our crocheted coffee carafe award. Um, and if you're new to uh, context and clarity, don't ask me about the crocheted stuff. I know where the crocheted bathtub comes from and I guess it just kind of rolled downhill the bo the ball of yarn rolled downhill from there i guess let's see scott is joining us from san francisco he's on linkedin jefferson from la so there's a trend here california is coming in on linkedin chris is in massachusetts on facebook and uh david delvecchio hi david over on youtube from cranford new jersey hmm that carries some meaning today you'll find out why here in a couple of minutes liz sloan welcome back from charlottesville uh, Rod is on the sofa in Monroe, Louisiana. I bet it's hot down in Monroe. That's just my guess. Jake Flitton says it rained all day in East Aurora, New York. He thinks he has a leaky window in the home office. That's not a good thing. You should call an architect. Maybe they can help you figure it out. And Emily, welcome back from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Glad you're joining us. Chucktown Sean is in the house. 
Glad you're here, Sean, as well. I uh, see lots of Facebook here, some uh, YouTube. Liz was on YouTube too, some LinkedIn. I don't see any Twitter right now or Twitch. I'm sure we'll have people logging in from those places. But if you happen to be on uh, Facebook right now and you're commenting away, you're saying, hey, I'm here. I want Jeff to say my name out loud and talk about where I'm from. But for some reason, it's just not showing up on the screen. That is because you are in a private Facebook group. Facebook has these rules that say in private groups, they can't let your name or your image and any of those things out unless you give them permission. So if you would like your comments to show up on the screen, like others, like Christian over in Ithaca, New York, he's on Facebook as well. Go, um, there's a URL in the bottom left-hand corner right now. Hey, there's this new feature. I've, I've, I've got a new toy. Sorry, I've got to do this. Streaming across, scrolling across the bottom of your screen right now. Um, if your comments aren't showing up, type chat.restream.io slash FB, like Facebook, in your browser with a couple clicks. You'll give it give Facebook permission to talk to Restream, which is this platform that we're using here, and that will solve all of your problems. Every single problem you have in this entire world will be solved by typing chat.restream.io slash FB. I, Mandy's kind of chuckling. I don't think she believes that. That all the problems. I was laughing solved. at John Jones. <laughs> oh, okay, so maybe she does believe you. What's John up to? He says. Uh, he says. Oh wait a minute! It scrolled. I've got to find him. I've got to find him. Where is he? Mike John M Jones is out of green M and M's. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, there's there's a green M and M shortage. For those of you that are not aware, I see I see Megan from South Dakota. Hi, Megan. That's a little foreshadowing there because Megan is going to be a, a Context and Clarity Live guest. I don't remember, maybe four weeks from now, something like that. And also a speaker at the uh, Entree Architect annual uh, annual meeting in Austin, Texas at the beginning of November. So hi, Megan. Glad you're joining us today. Um, what we do for all of our guests, all of our esteemed Context and Clarity Live guests, is we stock the green room with green M&Ms. And some guests eat more green M&Ms than others do. And sometimes those green M&Ms are hard to come by, but we'll have to find out from, uh, from our guests how that's going back there um, <laughs> with those, with those M&Ms. They're not brown. We're not, uh, was it, is it Van Halen? <laughs> is that the, is that the M&M story? I, I think, but uh, we'll find out about the green M&Ms here in just a minute. Brian McCartney is joining us today from beautiful Ohio, also on YouTube. Hi, Brian. Glad you're joining us today as well. All right. Hey, I don't know what? if you saw, but Barry snuck in, and I think he ah. might be the furthest so far. Ah, that's a good catch. Barry Reed yeah. on an evening walk from Scotland. Good day. Good evening to you, sir. Glad you're joining us. And that does put you in the lead for the Crocheted Yacht Award. Uh, good catch there. Glad Barry uh, is joining us today. What else? What else have I forgotten, Mandy? <laughs> it's your job to keep me on track. I don't know. I know. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Job. Everyone's yeah. telling us where they're from and 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 there's a few M M comments. Yeah. And uh how warm it is or how cold it is. Rod Wer Werner, I I don't understand Celsius, but I know you're just trying to be funny. <laughs> it's what did he say? It's ninety two Celsius or something? Thirty three. Oh, thirty three. Okay. Well, you say that out loud to somebody in the Midwest. That sounds like uh, sounds like okay weather. That sounds like winter to us. <laughs> <laughs> wrong, wrong measurement, wrong scale, but uh, that's what it feels like. Oh, Nicole! Right. Nicole beat me. She's 110 degrees in Arizona. Ugh. Yeah, but it's dry heat. It's dry heat. Don't worry. You, you still, you still lead for the uh, humid heat over there in California. All right, let's 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 jump into it here. We've got a great guest. We have a, a returning guest, actually, which is a thrill to have. This is only the second time that someone has returned to Context and Clarity Live, so we're honored to uh, be able to, uh, to uh, welcome this guest back. They are on a mission to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. And according to Simon Sinek, I have not verified this, but according to Simon Sinek, he's the top contender for the patron saint of entrepreneurs. He's a keynote speaker, and I think that his superpower, this is my own opinion, maybe he can dispute this, uh, maybe somebody else can weigh in here, but I think that his superpower is distilling 
complex problems down to their very essence and then building simple systems to solve those problems. That superpower is exhibited in the writing of his seven or eight or nine, or maybe it's 15 now. I'm not sure. We're going to have to verify that. Uh, all of these impactful business books that he has, I recommend every single one of them. Uh, they include Profit First, Fix This Next, and Now Get Different. Mike McAllowitz, welcome back to yes, Context and Clarity you. Live. Thank you so much. And uh, Mandy, thanks for having me back. I'll give you guys the shortcut for translating Celsius into Fahrenheit. You double All the right. Celsius number. So I think Rod says 33 and you add 32 because that, oh. that equates. So it would be 66 plus 32, which would be 98. So it's not exactly right, but it's around 98 Fahrenheit. So that's the quick. There you go. Yeah. That's the simple system. Yeah. Double that 32. <laughs> that's, Thanks, Mike. That's You're welcome. Yeah. It's been a pleasure being with you guys today. I wish you wonderful <laughs> success. Good luck. <laughs> Peace out. Peace I need to write out. that down. My little cheat sheet post. Yeah. 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 Who who would have thought that the mic drop moment was converting to, to Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, Mike, welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. We really appreciate you being here. Um, Pleasure. I, I really do think that that's your superpower. I, I haven't read all of your books. I've read four, <laughs> ma or I haven't read, let, let me be honest. I haven't read any of your books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've listened to four or five of your books. Um, we were talking about this earlier. I don't, I don't even know what the symbols are anymore. I don't read. I listen to books. But that's my takeaway from everyone that I have listened to is, hey, you've, you've, taken, this, you've taken this idea, profit first, mm -hmm. or, or a bunch of ideas, fix this next, and boil it down to the essence and then built it back up with just simple systems. And I, and as I was listening to, I've got to stop saying reading as I was listening to, uh, get different, it's the same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Oh my gosh. This guy understands marketing, understands how to break it down to a level that even a five-year-old can understand and then explain how, to, how to do this thing in, in an effective way. Um, For, can I say, it, Thank you for yeah, saying please. that because yeah. that is my mission uh, or, or promise is probably the better choice of words to my community. And uh, the tagline we use is entrepreneurship simplified, which yeah. you were kind of have to share my mission, which is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. There's a, there's a huge swath of small businesses that we go into business to become profitable, to not worry about bills, have financial freedom. Yeah. And it's the number one thing that doesn't happen. So my commitments to resolve that and the method to resolving it is by codifying ideas in a, in a way that we can, it's, it's highly consumable, it's highly actionable. And, and it, it's a lot of it's based upon the Pareto principle, also the 80, 20 mm -hmm. rule, the same, yep. same thing, different names, but uh, you know, what's the fewest things we can do that have the greatest impact in that category. That's why I try to do my book. So there's just, it's a big compliment for you to say what you said. So thank you. Yeah. Well, no, I, I appreciate what you're doing here. And I think, you know, again, we're, you're over the course of, of your books, you've, you've covered different topics. And now with this latest get different, you're talking about marketing mm. and, um, I built my career. Mm -hmm. I see others, Brian McCartney's built his career on helping architects and other professionals market. Mm. And I remember as I was listening to get different, one of the things you said early in the book or, or you talked about was the responsibility mm. to market. And that, that just, that hit me hard because I think about the people that I don't like marketing. I don't want to market. I don't like putting myself out there, you know, all those things. But can you talk about why we have a responsibility to market? Yeah, and, and I think it's very easy to measure. If you have clients refer business to you, they are validating through their action, which is one of the riskiest actions to take. They are offering to an established friendship or acquaintance a new relationship for them that may be a service to them, or maybe not. And if it's a bad introduction, it, it compromises their relationship. So it's really, there's a lot of social currency going on here. But if a client is referring you business, they believe in you so much, they're actually carrying the marketing responsibility in your back. I was at a conference recently uh, for photographers, and I said, by a show of hands, it was, it was a big conference, there was 
there was about 5,000 people in the room. I said, just by a show of hands, who feels they are better than the competition here in some capacity, not every way, you care more, you do higher quality work and so forth. And I would say 99% of the hands went up. To the 1% that didn't raise their hand, I said, you better find your differentiation and how you're better. Because if you're not better, why should anyone buy from you? But for the other 99%, I, I unequivocally agree they are better because they're doing something that they care about and they're finding their, their specialty, their, their special capability. And I said, if you're better than the competition, yet the competition is more noticeable, that's of disservice to your clients. If the architectural work you do is superior to the, the big brand name architectural firms or the local competitor down the street, if you're better, gosh, you have a responsibility to market accordingly, to be noticed. Because listen, if a customer is going to buy architectural services, they're going to buy the service. But if they can't find you, they're going to find someone of lesser value. So that is the client's problem, but, it, but it's your fault because you didn't make yourself noticeable. I, I really want to arm people with a, I was going to say vitriol or energy, or maybe just, maybe it's even channeled anger, but like, damn it, this is a responsibility. This is not something like, oh, if we have enough cash to do it, it doesn't necessarily require cash at all. Honestly, the less you spend, the more innovative you can become. Probably no cash is better. And uh, it's, it's not something that we can delay or only when we want to grow um, or we'll just do what everyone else is doing. No, no, you have to find a way to become noticeable. And um, this is something that doesn't wait. I strongly believe we are in the precipice of a recession. I think the indicators that I'm looking at shows maybe a pretty deep uh, recession. We have inflation going on um, and it may hit hyperinflation, which would be super risky. We see interest rates going up, housing collapse, but also the, um, there's other indicators too. And uh, what's gonna happen, unfortunately, I think, is many small businesses will say, no, we're in a recession, I've lost some clients, and golly, it's hard to get clients. But we gotta realize this, that I think across the board, if there was an average, let's say 10% of us, I mean, uh, all of us are gonna lose 10% of our client base. So if I have 100 active clients, I lose 10% of that, that's 10 clients. But if the big box business down the street has say 10,000 clients, they lose 10%, that's 1,000 clients. Now here's what's interesting, most small businesses most architects I know respond by saying, oh my gosh, I lost 10 clients. What can I do to claw them back? And I'm saying, listen, don't worry about them as much as the thousand that are entering the stream. Because some clients use a recession as an excuse. They say, I was never really satisfied with this prior provider, but I didn't really know how to end the relationship. We're in a recession. I need to cut costs. That's an easy call to make. And now I'm entering the market, but I'm op entering with open eyes. I want to, to purchase. And maybe that's only 20% of them that feel that way. And the rest are just delaying, but they only have 20% active clients. So now out of the thousand entering the market, again, 20% are in active buying mode. If I'm worrying about losing 10, that's the mistake. I should be focused on gaining the 200. I think as small business, we have a right to choose if we're going to participate in a, in a recession or not. And our marketing, how we behave around marketing is going to determine our success in navigating it. I, and I think... You know, I think when we are in those situations, you know, again, it, it's, there, there are a lot of architects out there huh. and architects <clears> could, <throat> um, you know, they could say, well, you know, it's tough, but there's a lot of attorneys out there. There's a lot of accountants out there. There are a lot of pizza joints out there, et cetera. So when you, I, I used this example this morning, we were in clubhouse this morning, kind of previewing this, this talk. And I said, you know, look, if, if, if you go to an AIA, American Institute of Architects, if you go to a conference and, and a bunch of architects in the room and somebody, somebody uh, snuck in, right? A non-architect snuck in and they walked in the room and they said, hey, I need to hire an architect. What do you do now? Right? You know, who, who in the room is an architect? Well, everybody, everybody yeah. raised their hand. So what do you do now? Um, that, that's one of the reasons I think this, this book is, uh, so applicable for architects because you're talking about that you, you mentioned better and different, and that's really what you're talking about through the whole book is, is if you're in a room full of architects or to, in a, um, uh, uh, environment, you know, where you're competing with architects, you've got to differentiate yourself in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it starts off with who is the community you're marketing to? This is the classic definition of an avatar. Is there an ideal customer? 
And what if that person walks in and says, I need an architect? And everyone's like, I can serve you, but you look at that customer and they're at the center for, you know, the Brooklyn Nets uh, and they're seven, seven in height, you know, they may have unique requirements for the design of their home over a quote unquote standard or generic customer. And the engineer or the engineer, the architect who has engineered or designed homes to cater to that community now has a leg up. But if we, we gotta be able to speak the language. And so uh, the architect says, oh, uh, it looks like you, you're a basketball player. And um, actually I've worked with other basketball players and I realize there's, there's special needs, particularly in regards to the design of the kitchen and the layout, uh, the bathrooms and, and the bedrooms. And if those three things aren't nailed, it becomes an uncomfortable situation. So we can cater to this. And every other architect's like, I'll make your vision come a reality. And that consumer knows, oh, you're a newbie. Here's what I equate it to. Imagine one of us uh, listening in right now had, and I wish this upon no one, but one of us had a heart attack or something. And you get rushed to the hospital and the, uh, the emergency room says, you need cardiovascular surgery immediately. And there's two doctors that we know of. There's this one doctor down the street. Um, he's a pediatrician, but he's really interested in being a cardiovascular, cardiovascular surgeon. He's never done it before, but he's interested and he could be really good and he's a doctor. Would you be interested? And it, and, he's, and by the way, he'll give you a discount. He'll charge you basically nothing to do it. Would you do it? Make, no, my life depends on this. Now, conversely, you go to the other doctor. She's done 100 operations already this year of the exact nature of yours. She's done over 1,000 in her lifetime. She's a 99.9% success rate. She can anticipate problems before they even present themselves. Oh, by the way, she charges $500,000. You can go with. Well, of course, the doctor that's versed in this because it is a life-saving situation. What we have to realize is that a portion, and usually the best customers, see your architectural services as life-saving or life-altering at least, that they're going to get their dream or they're going to get what they envision the right way, the, the one way, and they're going to disregard the generics. I think the mistake that many businesses make is say, well, you know, I can I can do that. I, I, I can try that out. And you're, you're watering down your perceived quality of service which means then you'll actually attract a very low level customer. Customer says, well, I just need an architect and I see all architects as the same. If a customer sees all architects as the same, you're already in trouble. But if you can distinguish yourself as that, that life-saving or life-altering provider, and it happens through marketing, because remember this, the only impression anyone has of your business until they do any business with you is your marketing. The first impression is your marketing. So it better be superior, it better speak to your unique offering and to that unique customer you're trying to serve. And, and they'll pay a premium for that. I, I, so what you're talking about now, and if we tie this back to the, the, the recession projection, I guess, um, this is where I see a lot of people get really nervous. Like, oh, yeah. I, you know, I don't want to specialize in something. Um, I've, I've worked with people in the past that have prided themselves I'm going to quote this and not, not attribute it, but, but, uh, we pride ourselves in being architectural generalists. Yeah. And then, and then when, when there are projections that are predictions, that's a better word, predictions that were headed towards a recession. Oh, I can't afford to, to specialize or niche down. I might miss out. But what you're talking about is sort of the opposite of that. Isn't it's the reverse it? because there's also a generalist consumer that what's called the commodity consumer. And in a recession, the commodity consumer, uh, just as all of us, sees see less dollars circulating. We have less in our purse, but becomes more critical of it. And they're seeing the if they see the offering they're purchasing as a commodity. It's in their best interest to uh, to to keep what's called downward price pressure uh, applied to say, hey, can you sharpen the pencil? Uh, I'm bidding this out, and and you're not as as good as a, as the other you know offer. Can you cut the price a little bit? So if you, you're a generalist, you track the general audience who will generally push you down, particularly in a recession. The specialist, which is interesting, is when it comes to life-altering or life-saving, if I have a heart attack in a recession, I'll find $500,000. I don't know if I got a by hook or crook, but I'll find a way to raise that money because my life depends on it. Some consumers, and I think it's the same volume of consumers, uh, still see during a recession that they're, the service they need are life altering. It's gonna, it's absolutely mandatory. And that's the one thing they're not gonna compromise on. We all make those choices of where we're not gonna compromise our life. Some people have passion for their vehicles and say, listen, things are tight and 
I'll, I won't go to restaurants anymore, but I'm still going to drive my, you know, seven series or whatever. Like, like that's critical to them. And there's a portion of consumers who see uh, architectural design, um, their, their commercial space, their personal space as everything to them. And they're going to still pay a premium. So in the specials will attract them. So I invite you actually to double down on pursuing this, but, but I do want to share one additional thing. Cause the other pushback I get is, well, what if that community goes away? Like what if, basketball players that are, you know, centers that are seven, seven or taller, all of a sudden go away. And the reality is industries or opportunities do go away, but I've studied every industry or opportunity that's, that's gone away in history, all the significant ones, and they've all gone through fades, through different speeds. So um, the, the, the analog dial telephone went away, but it was about 20 year attrition when the, but, the push buttons came and they were transitioning. There were strong indicators that it was time to change. And that got replaced now by mobile phones. And it's very hard to find anyone with a phone phone, a home phone, POTS line at their house, but still some exist. So there's often trends. I was looking at the advent of the vehicle, the car over the horse and buggy. And uh, that was about a 25 year transition. People were still riding horse and buggy and some people had automobiles. So we see these transitions happen, but I can't think of one instance where it's literally overnight. Um, when you see an indication and you see the, the metrics showing that the community you're targeting is fading, that is your opportunity to introduce something new. But uh, I wouldn't be fearful that you're going to lose all this business overnight. It, it, I, I don't see an instance of it really happening. Yeah. James Polk asked, how do you break into a new market? Oh, I'll give you the shortcut, James. If, if you want to, if you're, <clears throat> Dealing with point guards, but you want to start designing for centers. Yeah, right, right. And now you have this new hybrid of uh, center point guards, right? These guys are are seven seven. They can shoot from the three. Is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so what uh, you do is the easiest and fastest way into a niche community, and 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 to learn how to market to them is to look at your existing client base, identify the clients that a you like working with the most, B, pay you the most. And uh, let me tell you, let's start with B. Ultimately, people show their perceived value in you, not through their words, but through their wallets. So I was saying, trust wallets, not words. People will say, oh, you're amazing. Your architectural services were you know, off the hook. I love it. And then uh, you go on and Yelp, and you got a three star from them. You know, could have been a little nicer or something. It's like, what? But the customer that comes back to you recurringly uh, and keeps paying you is demonstrating through their action, they see value in you. But the, this needs to intersect with that you enjoy working with them. Because if you like working with that customer, chances are you have good rapport, chances are you naturally prioritize the services to them. When my caller ID pops up and it's James Polk, I'm like, Polk, I'm like, hey, it's James. Uh, it's someone else I don't like or don't know. I'm like, mm, you know, I'll call him back later. I'll let that one go to voicemail. So we deprioritize. Well, those customers pay you the most and you like the most are the ones that perhaps we want to clone. Now, I do want to share that, that that one set data set of one is not indicative of the entire community. So one point guard or center who's a, a wonderful person and great to do business with doesn't mean all centers are great people and great to do business with, but they are a gateway into the community. So once you identify this best customer or a few of them, sit down with them, meet with them and say, hey, tell me about you. I, I want to know where you learn, uh, where you congregate with other folks. What do you do to enhance your life? Not, not just around architecture, but do you have a home designer? Uh, do you have uh, real estate agents you work with? And maybe there's a broader community. Just get a sense for their life. Now, here's the key. Don't do this with the intent of finding other customers. That's the residual benefit you're going to gain. Do it with the intent of better serving that customer. Because if, if, if I go to a customer and say, hey, who else do you know? And how can I spread my wings a little bit? That triggers dilution for that customer. You, they had your undivided attention. Now they're only going to get a part of it because you're looking elsewhere. So instead, learn from that customer and how you can serve that customer better. Learn about how they learn and how they gain knowledge and how they hang out with people with them so you can understand the community. That's step one. Step two is start, start going to that community. Like if, if your best customer is a, we're leaning into basketball players now, this center, um, it, you know, should you, where they hang out? Oh, basketball camps, training camps. Um, maybe, maybe they go to a, a special, um, clothing fitters, you know, uh, for their, their unique sizes, those relationships, it, it, say that clothier, um, 
that that serves people that are tall, um, that clothier may have a lot of your prospects there. And that's actually your marketing spot now. Now it's like, hey, can we build some a relationship here? Or, or, or could I leave a sign in your retail store that says, looking for a home that fits your size? Uh, that's what we do. It will serve you far better than just putting another listing like every other architect somewhere out there and hoping the basketball player finds you. So go to their congregation points. Let's run with that for a minute. One, one of the, 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 maybe the cornerstone of, of get different is the dad uh, oh, yeah. system, the DAD system. So if you take that, right, we've got this seven foot six and above or seven, seven and above yep. basketball center. Sorry, everybody out there. We're going to talk about baseball next. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but but uh, if, if you, uh, if you take that as the ideal client, maybe the new ideal client, yeah. and now you've gone to the clothier. I love the idea. So how do we start to, um, you know, go down that path and apply the dad, that framework, system, yeah. the dad framework uh, in, in that environment? Yeah. So the dad framework is a basically a checklist of three critical elements. So I'll outline what that is. Um, and what my argument is, is you need to check off each item to optimize your marketing. It doesn't guarantee it's going to work. We're going to do experiments to test. But if you miss even one element, your marketing is crippled at best. And in most cases, no one knows what the dad framework is. So, or very few people do. So they say, well, this looks good. This is what everyone else is doing. And then they're disappointed when yet more Facebook ads didn't yield any return. It's because they're not applying that. Oh, and by the way, Jeff, I feel compelled. As a result of writing this book and making the framework this acronym DAD, I've heard every dad joke on the planet. I got to tell you the worst, aka the best dad joke. Because I've heard over like, I think over 600 now. Here it is. When does a good joke become a dad joke? When it becomes apparent. Oh, gosh. <laughs> we, yeah. we need sound effects. Sound <laughs> um, effects. Um, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the worst whoa, slash whoa. best dad joke. So here's what dad is. Um, first of all, does it differentiate from the market? And the reason this is important is the human mind is designed to ignore 99.999, it continues on, uh, of stimuli. In fact, as we're talking right now, for the individuals paying attention, the only way you can pay attention is actually by ignoring all the things around you. I got a little marker here, a highlighter in front of me. I could spend hours investigating this. You know, why is the word highlighter made and who made words and why is this yellow? And it can go on and on. But for me to provide focus and it's a survival mechanism, I have to ignore that stimuli along with all the others. The thing that does that is called the reticular formation. It's a neural network that sits on our top of our brainstem. It's, it's a literal and figurative net. And when a stimuli comes through to it, it says ignore it unless it was one of three qualifiers. It's a threat. Someone's going to harm me, hits what's called the amygdala or hyper response mechanism of our brain. So we go into fight or flight mode. Then uh, opportunities, known opportunities. I've seen this before and it'll serve me. It goes to the prefrontal cortex, conscious thought, and we say, how do we consume this safely? And the last thing is different. When something unexpected presents itself, our mind, the whole mind illuminates, hits the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, and the mind says, hold on, what, I've never seen this before. What is this? Because this may be a new threat or a new opportunity, or something I can ignore in the future. It is the only way that the human mind is mandated uh, to engage. So if you do something different, the, the consumer can't stop themselves from paying attention. And you've done this, you've seen this before, you walk down the street, you're walking all of a sudden, you do that, what, what was that? Your, your, your head is pulled almost automatically because you're seeing something you didn't expect. And in these milliseconds, you're looking at it and saying, oh, not relevant, it wasn't what I thought, or, oh my gosh, that's crazy, or, what is that? That's for me. So do different and it garners attention. The simplest way to get to different is look at what the standard approach is that your contemporaries, your competition are using to market to your customers. And that's the exact things you shouldn't be doing because they've become habituated to it. They, they're used to it and know it's ignorable. That's D, different. The A stands for attract. When you get someone's attention, I call it the blink test. You have about one-tenth of a second of engagement, that double look. And the mind, it's a, it's a supercomputer. It's now saying, is this of service to me? Is this attractive? Is it a new opportunity? The only way you can show them is by speaking their language, which means speak to a problem they have, speak to uh, a need they have, uh, entertain them or educate them. But they have to be saying, this, this is for me. 
So that seven foot seven dude, uh, you want first going, double taking and saying, we make furniture to support, you know, tall people. That is going to say it's for me. It's also exclusionary to everybody else, but it has to happen in these milliseconds, like a billboard. The last element then is D for direct. Direct is what does this person do next? And sadly, this is probably the most overlooked part of marketing. Get noticed, hopefully. People say, oh, I want this, or this is, this is compelling or interesting to me, but then they don't know what to do with it. Often this is obtuse direction, like, oh, you know, if you're interested, we can do business together. I see this on websites all the time. I land on a website and it says, uh, learn more. The whole freaking reason we have websites is to learn more. Don't make me learn more. It's, it's a circuitous pattern. I, I'm here to learn more. I don't need to learn more. Tell me what to do. You want a specific, reasonable, and safe option. So the option may be um, schedule your first, schedule a, a half hour consultative call, or maybe uh, give us your email and we can give you a tip of 10 mistakes people make when they consider an architect or something. There's got to be some exchange. But in a scenario like that, where I give something of value, the 10 mistakes, I also have now permission to communicate with you. My job is to matriculate that to a transaction. That's reasonable and safe. And what we do have to do is find the balance. We want to move them as quickly and as efficiently as possible, but we want them feeling safe throughout. The other mistake I see is people in the direct, uh, they go too big, too fast. They say, hey, um, thanks for visiting our website. Give us a $5,000 deposit and we can be your firm. I, I don't know anything about you and that will dissuade people. So be different, be attractive, speak to the need, interest, uh, you want the prospect saying this is for me. And the final thing is make sure you give them a singular direction that they feel re reasonable, uh, it feels reasonable and safe doing immediately. So we, we, um, we've got this basketball center. He's at the clothier. Yep. We've got this, the sign, you know, the architecture a house that fits you or furniture that fits you. That's definitely different. I don't see, of course, I am also not seven, six, <laughs> so I'm not going to that clothier. Uh, so maybe I don't know, but I, I doubt that many architects are doing that, uh, uh, at the tailor. Um, but let, let's say, yeah. So just playing out the scenario, let's say it's happening. Uh, here's, I'm just going to riff now. Um, yeah. first thing you want to do is if you can interview the prospect and say, Hey, what are common problems you have? I assume, uh, the, the kitchen basin, the, the sink is at a level for people who are, between five feet, and six feet. So if you're four feet tall, it's probably not that practical. And if you're seven or approaching eight feet tall, it's probably not practical. So assuming it's a seven, seven person, uh, maybe we gotta figure out that the, the sink basin is right above their kneecaps as opposed to uh, near their waistline. So maybe put a pair of pants in the window with like, like water stains uh, at the kneecaps and say, if you can relate to this and your sink splashes your knees, you have a poorly designed home. We fix that. You know, you want something where they come in, they go, what? Yeah. So first of all, it's different. How many people have water stained pants in the window? Secondly, they go, that's for me, right? Because it's speaking to their problem. Everyone else will be like, what the hell we're talking about? But the right person says, oh yeah, the sinks are way too low. And then the direction should be, uh, you know, schedule an appointment or, or give us a, uh, your email so we can give you the 10 things that tall people need for a properly designed home, something like that. That's just one idea. Yeah. Well, I think it's a great idea. And, and you know, for everybody out there in the audience um, that hasn't yet, I would encourage you to, to read or listen to get different uh, because there, as you go through, there's this continual, there, there are examples, right? There, there are case studies of, of people that you've worked with and that, that you know, but there's some great ideas. As I was listening to it, I thought, you know what? You could apply that in architecture. Oh yeah, you can translate them all. Something, I, yeah. I was, uh, I'll give you a couple of rapid examples because maybe it'll trigger someone's ideas here. Yeah. Uh, as a speaker, I noticed that um, most people market, as an, as an author and speaker, market the same way. They send out email blasts. Particularly when it comes to books. I write a new book, I email my community, my contemporaries do the same. And therefore, that means the consumer is becoming habituated to emails saying, buy my book. Everyone's used to that. Chances are you're used to being overwhelmed by email. And, and here's an example of habituation. If you've ever received an email that starts off with, hey, friend, I strongly suspect you delete that or throw it in your spam box because that's what habituation does. I remember the first time I got a hey, friend email. I was like, oh, my God. I have a friend who's so friendly, Jack. They don't even call me by my first name. I love who, which friend is this? And I saw it was smarmy marketing. I'm like, mm. I've never read one again. 
So different works, but it's a very short shelf life when other people replicate it. So that's why that's habituation. We ignore it. So I noticed everyone's saying email blast. I'm like, okay, that's what's being ignored. And I said, what can I do that's the opposite? This is one technique. So I looked at it and I said, well, it's white. It's a white background with black text. I said the opposite of black text would be white text, but a white text on a white background is invisible. That makes no sense. And I was like, oh my God, that's invisible. I can send out the first ever invisible ink email. That's what I did. With a launch of Get Different, I said, uh, in the headline in black text, said, this is the first ever invisible ink email. And there was one black line that said, click and drag your mouse below to reveal the message. And because it was white text, you know, you drag over, it turns blue, you can read the message. And it said, you're reading this right now because it was different and unexpected. And that will work for your marketing too. Uh, I invite you to check out my book and buy it right now. It was the best open rate and the best conversion rate I've ever had in an email because so, it's different. I'll give you one more example. My own little town here, I'm in Boot, New Jersey. That's a shout out to Cranford, Taylor Ham, and Cheese Country, the best part of New Jersey. <laughs> I was walking down Boot and Main Street and there are three, maybe it's now four um, fitness studios next to each other. They're, they're former retail stores, but they're fitness studios. Um, like these boutique shops where you come in, you lift weights and do stuff. Every single one of them had the same marketing, the before and after pictures in their window. Here's, you know, schlubby and unfit to jacked up and ripped client. And this is what we did for them. And all these men and women, we transformed their bodies. And I noticed no one, including myself, looks at them. You kind of just walk by like, okay, because we've all seen the before and afters. You're never gonna have someone that goes from unfit to even more unfit. Come join us. We know what's coming. So I said, that's the worst thing to do. So I came up with a concept and here's what was interesting. I went to these stores because they're right here. I said, I can help you transform your marketing. I'm writing a book about this. Every single one rejected me. And I wasn't surprised. We are terrified to do different. And there's a whole reason behind it. It goes back to the cave dweller days. We're terrified to do different. And that's why it's such an advantage. If you're willing, if you're bold enough to do different, no one else will be bold enough to replicate it. In Geek Squad was a computer company that would wear these crazy uniforms. They're a billion dollar valuation now with Best Buy because they dressed like geeks. And yet so obvious why they got attention, yet not another computer company in the world that I know of has replicated that. It's such an easy score, but it's scary. Hey friend was replicated because it was so easy. Just instead of putting, hey friend is a lazy way and hey Jeff, just put hey friend because it's a lazy way out. So that's why I got replicated. So what I did with these gyms, since they all rejected me, I found one in Salt Lake City, it was a CrossFit gym. And I said, hey, do you, uh, you want to do this? And they took me up on it. We got mirrors. This is another technique. Take ideas from another industry. I noticed when I went to the carnival and stuff with my kids that the fun house has like those goofy mirrors that make you look like E.T. and stuff. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I can't stop taking pictures of myself in these mirrors. So I look so ridiculous. And everyone else was doing the same. So we got two mirrors, one that made you look squat and kind of bloated and stuff. And we put that mirror in the, the store window and we put the word before over it. <laughs> we got another mirror that kind of stretched you out and made you look kind of ripped up and we put after. And so now you had in these mirrors before and after and people are walking by this studio in Salt Lake City and stopping, seeing themselves. It's different. How many times have you seen mirrors in a fitness studio? It morphs you because it's like a fun house. It's funny, which is attractive. You're taking pictures of yourself. We love to see ourselves. And then there was a direct the direct said, we just transformed you in mirrors. Now let's do it in real life. Walk in. They had a four times increase in foot traffic and probably still do. They sustained it and no one else is replicating it. So there's some ideas of breaking the norm of your industry. I, I love that. I love this funhouse mirror ideas. It's fun. <laughs> um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I can see a crowd gathering there. You know, I, I want to try it. I want to try it. Um, Michelle has a question. Uh, it's how do I make people aware of my work? And I think you know, different than, than the fitness studio, right? Because that's where everything is happening and whether it's the mirrors or the before and after yeah. or whatever, we see what's going on. But an architect, a lot of times, um, you know, you design something, it was built three years ago and now who knows who designed that? So in a case like that, what do you, is, is there a way to help people stay aware or get aware of, of, um, what you, uh, what you yeah, do. Yeah, there absolutely is. And uh, what we have to start with Michelle is the who. So people is a very generic term. And I, and I think the trap that you may fall into is anyone is a prospect. And that means really no one is a prospect because you're not speaking to their needs. That's the attractor, the A 
factor. If you're not speaking to my needs, you're not speaking to me. So we have to pick who are the people we want to go after first. Once you know those people, second thing is, what's the congregation points? Remember that saying, birds of a feather flock together? It exists because it's true. Um, you know, if, if say an author um, was a good prospect for you, many authors have libraries. Uh, I want to put a library in my house. And so maybe I'm a good fit, right? But I, as an author, see myself as, as very unique and my needs being unique. Well, if, if you identify authors as potentially a good prospect, then what you do is you say, well, where do authors congregate? Well, there's Facebook groups. Uh, we have, we have our own private uh, write and rant is a very famous one, which you, you may not even know exists because you don't know our community. And there's certain author conferences where all authors go uh, and communities. And we talk to each other and we don't talk just about how do you write a better book? How do you market it? We do. But we talk about other things too. Like, hey man, tell me how life's treating you. You wouldn't believe what I did with my house. And you start uh, spreading there. But also then you could start advertising to us. You can start building a list. You can start marketing to us. Um, and you can start speaking to the needs that are unique to authors, looking for that magnificent library or whatever it is and start speaking to us. So I, I, the starting point, and I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, but the starting point is to talk about a community first. And uh, trying to market to everyone means you have to come up with a million different marketing messages to really engage them. But trying to market to one type of person is better. And uh, there's been study over study after study uh, over about this, about niche specialization. Um, I think there's points of confusion. Niche specialization does not mean niche exclusivity. So I'm not saying serve authors and disregard everyone else. I'm saying serve authors and market to them. And as other opportunities bubble up because humans know humans, still take them if it's good opportunity. But just specialize in how you message to one community and then expand out. And inevitably, businesses that focus on a narrow community uh, start getting traction because they become specialists and then they can broaden out later. I think the mistake and what keeps businesses so small is we try to get any business because we feel any business is good business, but we're never able to get that message that really resonates with the best buyers in any special community. I think that's really great advice. And, you know, when we're thinking about, um, about being different, and when, when you're talking about a library for authors, maybe your business card needs to be a library card. I don't know. But, uh, um, oh, yeah, but yeah. oh, my God, I love it already. Right. The old Dewey decimal system. Yeah, absolutely. But that works. You know, stuff like that works. I, I was talking with these photographers and I said, what's the common approach to marketing? And they said the most cutting edge thing that very few people do that really is a game changer is mailers of postcards. And I'm like, are you effing kidding me? I, I get them all the time. And Jeff, you got them too, where it's a postcard. And it's like this cheesy picture of a family. And they're like, it's portrait season. Come in for your portraits. So I said, what's the opposite of that? What, what, where do the best pictures go? And they said, well, if you make a best picture, it goes into a frame. I said, then let's not mail out postcards of pictures. Let's mail out empty frames. And uh, some of these photographers did the test with me. They sent out an empty frame. And inside the frame, um, there was a, simply a saying, and you've probably never received an empty frame, so that'll be engaging. You get a piece of the mail, an empty frame. You're like, what the heck is this? I didn't order this. So you're compelled, curiosity, to read it. The attractor factor was this. It said, most pictures go into the cloud, but the ones we love go into frames. We create the pictures you will love. Powerful, right? That's the attractor factor. It clicks with the right audience. And then the direct was, book an appointment um, with our studio. And they... There was three or four uh, photographers that did that. They all had a bump in opportunity coming their way. So that that library card, wickedly smart because I've never seen that before. And it's, wor it's worthy of an experiment. It's worthy of a test. Yeah, I, I love that. And and so just just to uh, let you know, we've got about three minutes before you need to to bounce. So. Um, yeah. I just noticed Mark LePage, by the way, is a at-home <laughs> library specialist who focused on entrepreneur authors and Boone. That wow, John Jones, thank you. I found my guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's following up on Mark's. Uh, I know a, a good architect who can help with the library. So that's great. Hey, welcome to the marketing hour, everybody. Um, Mike has to uh, bounce here in just a couple of minutes because he's got another call coming up. So when when uh, Mike has to uh, step away, hang on, stick around with us for a few minutes. And we'll wrap it up after after he has to go. But we're going to be um, watching the time for him. May maybe 
there's so much, there's so much more in this book that we, we could definitely cover, but maybe to follow up and to continue that train of thought about being different. Um, Michelle also asked a question when, when it comes to being different, how far is too far? That's a great question. When it's no longer authentic to who you are. So get different doesn't mean be different. And, and there's a subtle difference, but get different means to actually amplify your idiosyncrasies and uniquenesses, but be absolutely genuine and true to yourself. Uh, being different means being someone you're not. And uh, people can see through that. That was one of the risks I ran when I wrote get different. People are like, oh, you mean be outrageous, uh, be goof. I lean into silliness and uh, that's naturally who I am. And so the ultimate compliment is when someone sees your marketing and then they experience your business and say, that's exactly what I wanted. So it, I had an accountant I was working with who's extremely serious. Um, she, has, she has a flat affect, but she loves the numbers. And she was having trouble converting clients because clients would call, and like, you don't even really care about my business. You're just so blah. So what we simply did, we did one little change. We said, let's call you Spock because that was her favorite, that was her superhero. She's like, Spock's so logical. It's all about logic. So when she started a call, she'd say, listen, um, before we have a conversation, I will be so engaged in your numbers and engrossed in your numbers. I have a flat affect. A lot of people call me, it was a woman, so a lot of people call me Mrs. Spock. Um, is that okay? And then people are like, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. And then she would not, she didn't have to change a thing about herself. And that's the whole goal here. She amplified, she doubled down on who she naturally was and the conversions improved significantly for her. That's what we're looking to do. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's awesome. Amplify. Hey, <clears throat> Fantastic. Hey, um, John Jones had a, a question for you, Mike, just slipping yeah. it in real quick. He wants to know if there is a central Jersey. <laughs> there is, there is. It's, it's, it's south of Route 78, in my opinion. But uh, <laughs> so there's North Jersey, Central Jersey, and South Jersey, and the the, the 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 continent will always be divided, if you will. And what divides us is the ham we get on our sandwiches. So in North Jersey, we have what's called Taylor ham, and in South Jersey, they call it pork roll, and they have no idea what they're talking about down there. It's going to be a constant battle between North and South and Central stuck in the middle. They, they just, no one likes them, to be honest. So <laughs> that's the reality. <laughs> I, I love that. Mandy, I'm glad that you, uh, I'm glad that you caught that one because that's, that's awesome. that has been a running joke inside of, we've been doing context and clarity for hold on, two and a half years now, believe it or not, 500 and some odd uh, episodes now. And that the, the, is there a central Jersey has been a running thread oh, that's and funny. joke for two and a half years. So thank you for those of us who are not in New Jersey and have no idea what all of you people are joking about and ribbing each other about. I really appreciate that explanation. I like Mark Page says Taylor Ham rules. So I know he's from Northern Jersey. He's probably off the parkway. That's where the, the vein of Taylor Ham, I assume he's around exit 135 off the parkway, just guessing. Uh, because that's where the Taylor Ham country really gets gets pretty heated. And angry. He says Paramus, born and raised. Yeah, in Paramus, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, Mike, um, thank you. Thanks for yeah. It's been a joy, Jeff, Jeff. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you so much. Thank I'm wishing you, everyone trans success. If I can just leave one departing thought is absolutely the world is starving for small business success. I, I think this is. This is the pinnacle moment. As we go into this recession, we have an opportunity to step up. And uh, for the longest time, I've been saying small business is the backbone of the economy. I've been using that refrain, and I, I now regret it because it's not true. Small business is not the backbone of the economy. Small business is the economy. We, the global society, the global economy is depending on you. So please get out there and kick ass for serving all of us. That's awesome. Mike, thank you. Really appreciate it all the time. You are um, you, you are welcome back here anytime when your next book comes right. out or we're going to be I'm talking in. to Aaron. We're going to be talking I am to her. In. All All right. Right. Well. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. All right. Everybody else out there, we've got a few more minutes yet. Uh, I saw Jake's comment a minute ago. Uh, I've got to click back over here. He says, uh, he said, Hey, wait, the, it's already been an hour. He, yeah. It just, we went super fast. Um, I, I realized about 43 minutes in, it's like, oh my gosh, we haven't touched on like 
half of the book. So what I hope that all of you will do, it's, it's not a super long read on, again, I don't read, I listen. So on Audible, it's only like four and a half hours long, which is not a very long book. So um, if you if you say to yourself, or it, maybe you say it out loud, I don't like to market. I don't know how to market. I don't have a marketing budget. In, any of those um, uh, uh, objections to marketing, please get this book and go through it. I said this this morning on Clubhouse. I think if you if you read or listen to the book, I think it presents a great opportunity to you because everything that he's talking about, you heard him say while we were talking to him just a few minutes ago, Mike said, even if you have no dollars, right? Read this book. It's about the creative juices. It's about using that creativity that, that you all have. So, uh, check the book out. It's, um, I think it'll really help maybe help you think differently about the uh, the way that you market, the way that you, you talk about what you do, about people that are seven feet, seven inches tall. I don't know. <laughs> I see uh, Mark Mark says it's a super easy read, very much worth the time. Uh, what, el- um, what else? Did we have any questions or comments that we didn't get to that we might be able to address here? Um there was a comment that was repeated from this morning about marketing in another geographic area or right, if right. you were new to town and marketing. And I don't know if I don't know if we were hoping for Mike's answer on that, but I felt like he touched on that a little bit in um marketing to new potential uh markets for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I think um you know, I've been saying this all week. So for any of you that have, have been joining us or, or maybe missed our Context and Clarity live conversation or our Context and Clarity conversations this week, what I've been trying to do with the topics is tie last week's Context and Clarity live with, with Kevin Costello to this week with Mike Michalowicz because they were both marketing topics. And there are so many similarities between what Kevin is doing and what Mike is talking about. Kevin is a firm owner, about seven people in their firm out in Arizona. And so everything that he talked about was basically earned experience. It's the things that they're doing, what's working, what's not working, how they're succeeding. And of course, Mike is, is a great thinker and author and, and uh, consultant. And in both cases, it starts with understanding who you're marketing to. So I guess in that instance, you know, wh- where is this new area? It's a place you just moved to or a place that you'd like to reach out to. And what's driving those clients in that, in that place? Um, we did, I guess, talk about it a little bit in, in hey, well, now we're going to start marketing to a seven foot, seven inch uh, human being, you know, basketball center. And we haven't done that before. I guess we're just replacing a, a geography with a human in that case, but it comes down to the humans, right? Um, the, uh, one, one thing that worked for a firm that I worked at before in expanding to different geographies, we ended up going to five different states, um, were to get the clients that wanted to grow um, geographically. Yeah, that's a good idea. So you get in and you start projects in new areas because the client wants to be there. And then when you're there, you spread from there. Yeah. Now on, on the flip side of that, I'll give you an example of a firm that I was talking to a couple of years ago. Well, a few years ago, probably now pre COVID. Um, and we were having this conversation about repeat clients and referrals, you know, how much, how much, marketing are you doing and how much is, is coming to you? Maybe it's a different way to, to think about that. And a lot of you have heard me say before that every firm out there is a large percentage of their work comes from repeats and referral and, and or referrals. And I hear everything from about 60% to um, as high as 97%. Well, this is, this is the 97% example. 
they said, hey, 97% of our work comes from repeats and and or referrals because we're the, uh, I'm not going to give away too much about their location and, and so on and so forth, but we are the, we're seen as the experts in this type of project in, in this state. And, um, you know, 97% of our work is walking in the door to us. I said, okay, well, what's the problem? And said, well, we don't really have a problem. You know, maybe the problem is that we were, we've lost, we haven't been exercising the muscle. So, okay, well, what are your plans for expanding? Oh, well, we're going to this other state, uh, you know, expanding to a new state. So, okay, well, how are you going to do that? Oh, we don't, we don't, we're not worried about that because it's repeats and referrals. Let me raise my hand for a minute, (laughs) right? You've been doing this for like 30 years in this state and the works walking in the door because you're the expert on that type of project in that state, you know, it's repeats and referrals. Unless those people are also in that other state, you've got a problem, right? So then, you know, is it getting people here to refer you to people over there? You know, what what are you going to do, right? You can rest on your laurels here, perhaps where you are, but you've got to do something different over here, even to get yourself on the radar, because there's somebody else in that state saying the same thing. Right. You know, their version of that same thing. So I like what I like what you're talking about, Mandy, you know, that experience of of going with the clients. The danger is assuming that which is a different situation than what you're talking about. The danger is assuming, hey, just because we're doing this here, you know, maybe it applies to New Jersey. You're doing this in South Jersey. Is it going to work in North Jersey? Again, I don't know New Jersey. It might not. <laughs> there's, there's apparently that dividing line is pretty strong. Mark says that Mike narrates his books and makes them unique for the print ver- from the print version. Absolutely, they're fun books to listen to because he is uh, he's narrating them, and you get you get all of his uh, personality. He goes off script a lot. Uh, you get, you get asides and, and, uh, um, you get a story, although he said it's, this is in the print book too, but you get a story about how Santa was killed in the study with the beard straightener. Um, there's a reason alone to, to read the book. Also, he, he mentions Jesse Cole. Actually, there's a whole chapter about Jesse Cole and the Savannah Bananas past context and clarity live guests. So, uh, Read the book. Listen to the book. It's a good one. <laughs> Mark says he's got a roll. We passed the top of the hour. Uh, he's got a roll, and um, we're all cheering for Hen- Henry LePage this week. He's at Nationals, uh, rowing in Nationals down in Sarasota, Florida. So go Henry. Hopefully uh, he comes home with the gold there. Yeah, good luck, Henry. And, and Mark, thanks for... Thanks for um, thanking me for being the co-host today. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris says content-based networking strategy is a good way to break into new geographic areas. It is. It is. We we have had uh, a number of guests here on Context and Clarity Live that have strategies. Uh, an, another, somebody was asking, oh, it was um, somebody on Clubhouse this morning and I apologize, I forget who it was, but was asking about your ideal client. Um, go check out Book Yourself Solid. That w- that's, that's another great book. We talked about that uh, two months ago, maybe, maybe three months ago. Time's, time's flying. But um, there's a, there are, are great exercises for um, identifying and, and digging into who your ideal client is in, um, uh, in book yourself solid. So just go over to the entree architect YouTube channel, find the playlist for context and clarity live and scroll through some of these marketing topics. There's people come on here. People like Mike come on here and, and share a lot of knowledge. So, um, so there's lots, lots out there giving you a little bit of preview. I know we're past the top of the hour, but next week, Context and Clarity Live. So a week from today, Thursday, June 16th, we will have Brad Levitt as our Context and Clarity Live guest. Brad is a very high-end builder 
contractor in Arizona, works exclusively with architects. And so next week, we're going to talk about the architect builder relationship. I thought that would be a really interesting spin on something that that uh, you guys deal with probably day in and day out. So uh, Brad, Brad's a fantastic guy. He's actually, he's got a, uh, a great podcast as well. It's the AFT podcast. Um, I've been a guest. That's not why it's a great podcast. I've been a guest on his podcast. Uh, he interviews architects on his podcast and builders and others. You should check that out. But uh, it's AFT, a finer touch construction and a finer touch um, podcast, I think. So uh, Brad will be our guest next Thursday. All right. We're going to wrap up the week of Context and Clarity Conversations tomorrow, starting at 9 a.m. on uh, Clubhouse tomorrow morning and then tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group with the same question. What do you do for your clients that's different? Ties pretty well with this conversation today, I think. So be thinking about that. Join us tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Eastern on Clubhouse or 4 p.m. Eastern inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group, and uh, we will have that conversation. Mandy, thank you for being the co-host today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great having you here. Um, Catherine, hopefully everything is going well today. She's she, You're just going to have to ask her. She's probably going to have some exciting news to share, so that's very cool. And... Um, we will do this all over again tomorrow, everybody. So until then, please take a little bit of time to breathe and relax. Find a little bit of time, some way to get rejuvenated. It's a long, it's a long road. This is the long play. We do this every day. So find some way to take care of yourself. Be well, stay safe, keep those around you safe and well. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you all somewhere sometime soon. Thanks, everybody.